sorry. All right, today is Thursday, April 27, 2006. We are at Orchard Park High School doing our hometown heroes interviews. We are interviewing Mr. Al Burak, who served during World War II, and the interviewers are Josh Rodemus and Eric Rasso. Okay, I'm going to leave you guys for about a half an hour. Um, learn about what life was like in the service during World War II, and uh, have a good time. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Brock, were you drafted or did you enlist in the Army? We enlisted. Enlisted. It, uh, well, it, it, the day after Pearl Harbor, we went down to the post office. <laughs> the line must have been a mile long. Got there at about 6 o'clock in the morning, got sworn in, or did get sworn in, got up to uh, get sworn in at uh, 11 o'clock at night. Well, we had, went, had to go through all the physicals. Right. Got up there, and they said, uh, let's see, what branch of the service are you going in? I said, the Coast Guard. Mm. Oh, he said, it's filled. Mm. I says, so I went up with three of my friends. We were all going to be together. Right. I says, well, he says, you got your choice. You got the Marines, you got Air Cadets, you got uh, the Navy. I says, all right, I'll take Air Cadets. He says, got to go back upstairs and take some more physical. 2.30 in the morning, I got sworn in. And then I uh, left two days later for Fort Niagara. Got down to Fort Niagara and started going through all the uh, in inter the movies they show you about sex and everything else, you know, yeah. I, you got to the point that when you come out of the movie, you had to put gloves on before you shake hands with a girl. <laughs> it was that bad. It was scared the heck out of you. Just a naive little kid coming out and holy macro. And then um, one morning, this is January. Cold, and I didn't get up in time to get completely dressed to go off for roll call. The overcoats were right down to the ankle, so I wasn't worried. I just had my underwear on, put the overcoat on, fell in. Which man do you think the sergeant picked to open up the coat to check the clothes underneath? Me. <laughs> Three days on KP on a train going to Florida to the Air Cadet School. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm telling you, you ever tried slicing bread on a train that's moving? One slice is this, the next slice is like that. Making salad, break up the lettuce, put it in there, pour the mayonnaise in, get in with the arms and mix everything up. <laughs> Same with the eggs. Mix the eggs up every now and then a shell and everything would fall in. Hey, mix them right up with that too. <laughs> and uh, of course, I didn't eat what I cooked yeah. all the way down. <laughs> and that was three days on the train going to to Miami Beach. And uh, then uh, we got our rooms in a nice hotel right on the beach. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we started training. And we spent uh, probably the from six o'clock in the morning till eight on the drill field marching and the rest of the stuff, getting in shape that way. And then we'd go to class. Class, what did it last? Maybe six months. There were, there were less instruments on an airplane than there were on a car. So you didn't have to learn too much. It was just getting used to, like you get used to driving a car. Only this was easier, there was nothing to bump into. And uh, finished there. And then, uh, at that time, you had to be a mechanic because if your plane got shot down or any damage done to it, you had to help the mechanics on the ground <coughs> with it. Mm -hmm. This served two purposes. You were more careful with the plane. And so, I, then I went to a crew chief school in uh, Newark, New Jersey. And then I went to N-Line Engine School in Detroit. And from there, I stayed in Detroit and tested liberators when they come off the end of the assembly line to see if the Army would accept them after they were built. Mm -hmm. And then from there to Salt Lake City and uh, 
after Salt Lake City, I went to Colorado Springs, Colorado, where the Air Force Base is now, Peterson Field. And there we were training combat crews to go overseas on liberators. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think I was there about six months. And then uh, we, I, I, went, I went overseas alone. I went overseas from there. I went to North Carolina to board the ship to go over with the invasion of Africa. And when I got to Africa, they didn't need bomber pilots. They were fighter pilots because of Rommel's force and the desert there and the tanks and everything. So I went into P-40s. The P-40s had the scoops on the bottom. When you went over the sand, it would pick up the sand and it would cut down the operation of the plane when you're trying to maneuver up there. So that didn't last long. They brought P-38s in. Unbelievable. You could fly it on one engine. It would do anything you wanted to do. That finished the German loop off, off our group. Now, I met a fella in January. I was in a hospital in Florida, and he was in the bed next to me. Now, I hadn't seen him in about 60 years. He'd shot down 14 German planes. He was in our group, the first fighter group. And that was Eddie Rickenbacker's outfit. So any thing that they wanted to get publicity for, it came to our group. The biggest, the, of course, the best thing was, the fun, the fun thing about it was the steam engines. You go down with your cannon and you hit that front of the steam engine where the water was and it just explodes up into the air. That, that was the best time we had with it there because nobody got hurt and uh, it was it, the and as far as the uh, maneuvering and fighting in the air it's a lot different than it is today because when you were up there you could see the man in the other airplane that you're going after mm -hmm. I mean here there the the Germans were just as young as we were you know, 18 years old and everything else, and uh, it was it was a, a learning experience, I'd have to say. Yeah. So, um, how old were you when you enlisted? I was 18. I was just in my first year oh, of college. Yeah. I'd okay. got gone to uh, Canisius on a football scholarship. And you grew you grew up in well, the Buffalo area. Pardon me. You grew up in the Buffalo area. Oh yes, 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 in Riverside. Oh okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you said it was definitely a learning experience? It was. It was. I mean, you're, you're getting involved with people from all over the United States. A chance that you'd never have before. Uh, their lifestyles were uh, different. Of course, most of the lifestyles were fairly the same because this was a depression. Mm -hmm. We were coming off of a depression. Everybody was slim and trim. I think I weighed 130 pounds at the time. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> it, as I said, uh, it was great getting to know these other fellas because they were just as nervous as you were. Yeah. You know, everybody went down, everybody enlisted, and it, at that time there were not too many draftees because they had more than enough enlist enlistments to fill the quota that they needed at the time because they didn't have the camps and stuff to train them in. That, that, as the war developed, the camps developed, and uh, they, it uh, increased uh, the people working back on the states doing the uh, training. Do you remember um, like your first days in the service, what, what uh, training was like, any of your uh, instructors, things like you that? You know, I don't remember any of the instructors. Everything went so fast. The thing was this, the war was starting and you they had to get you out. Right. I mean, it wasn't one of these things that you spend uh, six weeks here and four weeks there. This was hurry or go. You know, when you graduated from Air Cadet, you graduated as a flying sergeant. Mm -hmm. And then they give you the other ranks when we got over to Africa. But in the Air Force, in our unit, there was no rank. The mechanics, the cooks, everybody ate in the same mess hall, ate the same thing, went into town together, enjoyed each other, because each one depended on the other one. Mm -hmm. 
So I mean, as far the, 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 from the private to the captain or anything else, everybody was together. Nobody, there was no saluting, nothing like that in our unit. It was a, it was like a family unit, and it worked very well together. It wasn't a big unit; it was a small unit, but it worked very good together, very well together. Um, were there many casualties in your unit? You know, ironically enough, in the Air Force. You never saw a casualty. If anybody got shot down, they were taken care of where they were. If, like when we, a uh, couple of times we had the bomber missions over Palesti, the oil fields. And when somebody would get shot up, like one day the co pilot, I'm saying something to him, I looked over and he's laying there. He got a piece of flak right through his helmet into his head and he was dead. All right, we stopped at another air base took all the casualties off. When we got back to our air base, nobody knew anything except there was somebody missing. They never saw, we never saw any of the blood and guts that the men on the field, the ones that really did the fighting saw. I mean, no, I can remember one Christmas, it was overcast and we couldn't fly, and I grabbed a mail truck and I went up to the front. I think it was at Palesti. And I couldn't believe it. When I got out of the truck, the bodies of the men were all piled up, waiting to be put on trucks to be brought back. It was it was cold. It was every, they were all frozen. But this is the first experience that I had where I saw something like this. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you never saw anything in the Air Force. All the casualties were dropped off someplace else, and then we came back to our own <coughs> field and went on to our normal life. We had to repair the plane when we got back the holes that were put in from the flak and stuff like that. But other than that, there was no, uh, you never saw any casualties. Were you or any uh, other members of your unit ever taken prisoner of war? No, no, no. That's one thing, uh, the bomber crews, the, main, the ones that come over from England that were shot down right. and, re and were able to recover by coming parachute or whatever it was, they were taken prisoners of war. The first, with the fighting planes, you weren't taken, you were either shot down or you come back to your base. There was no in between, as a rule, as a rule. But uh, uh, I can't think of, anyway, I think I, I, I only used the parachute once. And it was a scary experience. I mean, even though I'd practiced before in, uh, air, in cadets, it, when you have to do it, when you're involved in something, it's a different feeling. Even though it's, 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 everything happens so fast, but still you have that little fear of what's going to happen, where am I going to land? And uh, you're not so much worried about getting shot or anything as the landing, because today the, air, the those parachute groups, I don't know how they do it, but once was enough for me, landing. Um. Did you ever award any medals or citations? Everybody got the same thing. Every time you, you went from <coughs> Africa, you'd get a medal for being in Africa. You'd get a medal for being in Italy. You'd get a medal for going into southern France. The, and then you got your uh, good conduct medals and all of that stuff. And every so many missions, you'd get another uh, medal for flying. And then you'd get oak clusters added on to that. And what was nice, I don't remember exactly how many missions it was. Something like maybe 30 missions. You'd get a 10-day rest camp, and you had your choice. Now, the first one I took on the Isle of Capri. You live like a king. And the second one I took to Switzerland, because we hadn't had milk in, in, in a year and a half or two, other than powdered milk. And in Switzerland, you got ice cream, and you got milk yet, so the 10 days we spent in Zurich was great. And then the next one was over in uh, uh, Bari, Italy, on the Adriatic. And I had a beautiful home right on the uh, overlook in the Adriatic, on a little hill. And I'd get up in the morning and the maid would open the curtains. I'd look down on the beach and you'd see the men pulling the big nets full of fish in. And it'd be piled up on the beach there, and they'd sit there when they got the nets in, and 
grab a bottle of wine and a piece of bread and grab a couple of the fish and eat them. I watched him do that <laughs> for about three days and I said, there's got to be something to this. So the next day I went down to the beach. I grabbed one of those fish that was still wiggling and tried to eat it. <laughs> it didn't work. The bread and the wine didn't make any difference. It just didn't taste very good. But uh, you got treated. You got treated like a king on the rest camps. They really took care of you there. How did you? Uh, how did you stay in touch with your family while you were there? I was very poor. Very poor. In fact, it got to the point that my family got in touch with the uh, Red Cross to see uh, where I was and what I was doing. I, I, I didn't write letters that often. Didn't write letters, didn't take pictures, just did what I was supposed to do and uh, did a lot of sightseeing. Whenever we'd get moved to a new base, I'd take a jeep out where we weren't flying and go to the various little towns and visit the churches and the various uh, art exhibits that were there. and. Uh, I, I didn't miss too much from Morocco on up through uh, Italy. Up, well, I, the last place in Italy was on the Isle of Capri, or uh, it was the, an island off the southern prayer of France. We, in, we flew from there for the invasion. We'd fly over in the morning and empty our guns and our, well, we had the, the uh, four machine guns and the one uh, cannon on the front. Then we'd go back and another plane would be ready by that time. We'd climb into that plane and go back over on another mission. And we did that all during the invasion when they were going in from England in. We were going in from the south mm -hmm. up that way. But it, uh, as I said, it was a learning experience. Mm -hmm. um, before you went on your missions, did you have anything special that you did for good luck? Yeah. You know, strange as it may seem, when you're at your age, you have no fear of anything. Yeah. You don't have enough sense to be afraid <laughs> of anything. Yeah. So, I mean, you didn't think about anything until it was over with. Mm -hmm. you, you were kept fairly busy all the time. You didn't have too much time to think, really. Mm -hmm. uh, it got a little lonely on Christmas and uh, on your birthdays and stuff like that when you were over in your tent there, but other than that, you were kept pretty busy, really. Um, what did you do for entertainment while you were there? The USO would bring shows over, and you know, like Bob Hope, and, their, and it, they were all good shows. And then uh, we had, we hooked up a little radio in the tent that we could get whatever station was on the air at that time on it. And then behind the tent, we had a belly tank off of our fighter plane that we used for the fuel on the long missions. So we had that mounted there, and then we had a copper line running into our tent. And we cut one of those large barrels in half and put it in there, because in the winter it got cold, even though our tents were in an olive grove. And Whenever, whose ever turn it was to light that flame when it, or the, the 100 octane gas when it come in, you'd get your eyebrows burned off every time when it bounced up like that. But it kept us warm and uh, other than that, uh, you know, it was good. Uh, there was about four guys in a tent and cots and uh, it was, because we traveled a lot. In, in, uh, in Africa, we lived in pup tents. One man pup tents, and that because uh, we moved, we were constantly on the move. We had a engineer. The engineers were great. The, our airfields were large pieces of metal that were hooked together, and they would come in and lay that airfield out. First, they'd make it level with the, their bulldozers and stuff, and they'd lay it out. And then, possibly within another two weeks, we'd be moving up as the front moved up with our airfields. The engineers would just keep moving the plates up there making new landing strips for us and stuff. Uh, they, they, were, they were great, the engineers. They did a terrific job. Um, do you recall any um, particular unusual event that happened while in Africa or while in the service? Uh, 
going into the Kasbah was something that uh, an experience uh, that uh, the architecture, the people, the music, the dancing and stuff, there was something that I'd never seen before. And I enjoyed that. And then, as I said, every place I went, there was something new that I'd never experienced before, and that experience was was great. Mm -hmm. well, I know a lot of guys that have been in the service can develop a great sense of humor. Did you or uh, any of your buddies do any prank pulling or anything like uh -oh. that? Well, I don't know if this should be on television, but we had one of our guys that did a lot of drinking, <laughs> and so he'd come in loaded at night. and. He'd fall in his bunk, fully dressed, fall asleep, and his ha our hand would be hanging out of the bunk. So we went and got a pail of warm water, put his hand in the warm water, and when, you know, when you put the hand in the warm water, you gotta go up to the bathroom. So he'd go to the bathroom all over himself there. We got <laughs> planks like that. I mean, uh, the only thing is, nobody ever stole anything from anybody because they were taken care of by the men in the group. If that's one thing you had to never had to worry about. But other, there were pranks all the time, yeah, because you had to amuse yourself, mm -hmm. even though you did get some uh, amusing uh, antidotes on the radio and stuff like that. Sure, again, a lot of the radios were what the in Italy were in Italian, so you had to learn basic parts of the the basic words so you could get along. Right, and. Uh, then when the war ended, I went to the University of Florence for a semester, and I enjoyed that very much. I took an arts course there. There were, they, they picked, uh, I think it was 15 of us from different groups to go to go to school with the Italian students to see if we could compete with them. And it, it was very, it was excellent. Um, do you recall the day that the war ended, and what were you doing? we just come back from a mission, and the war ended, and we heard about it, and we celebrated. And the next day, we were getting ready to go to the Pacific. We got our planes ready, and then they said, we've got a new shot that you're going to get so you won't catch the flu or anything else going from this type of a, a situation in Europe to the Asian theater over there. So they gave us all a brand new invention, a flu shot. Mm -hmm. We didn't get out of bed for two weeks, we were so sick. I think they were experimenting. <laughs> so by, by the time we got out of bed and got everything else going, the war in Japan ended. So then we couldn't all come back at the same time. You had to, you, the, like the time that you were there were the number of points you had, and by the number of points you had was how they designated your return to the United States. So I figured I had to wait a little while, so I went, that's why I went to the University of Florence. And then uh, we, uh, it took us three weeks to come home on a Liberty ship. I didn't think we were ever gonna get there. I think you could have rode faster to get back. And uh, on the particular ship that I was on, the Nisi Division, the Japanese American Division, most of them were on that ship. And these, these men were terrific. They had medals coming out their ears. They had fought on that ground and they had pushed the Germans back so far, it was unbelievable. But you never heard a word. Very quiet, they sat and played cards all night. They, they were afraid of the ship, so they didn't sleep. They just kept playing cards and sitting there, and it was a, really an experience. Mm -hmm. uh, even that coming back. But uh, other than that, it wasn't, I can't think of too much. You know, you forget stuff after 60 years. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, sometimes I forgot what happened yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, before you went to the university, did you, um, did you visit your family at home or no? Oh, no. Once you left, you, I, in the States, I came home twice. Uh, my mother got operated on for gallbladder and for a thyroid condition. And I was able to come home four days at each time with that. That was from Colorado and that was from uh, Detroit. I took the train home each time.
But other than that, once you went overseas, you were done. You stayed until the war ended. Mm -hmm. That was it. So, uh, while you were overseas, did you keep any kind of uh, personal records? Maybe a nothing. Day, nothing at all. Nothing. Just all up here. Uh, everything. That's right. That's right. As I said, I I wasn't prone to doing any writing at the yeah. time. Yeah, you probably didn't have much time to do that anyway. They kept you so busy, right? We were kept busy most of the time. Yeah. Um, so you went back to school after the war. Um, did you keep any of your close friendships with the fellows? Not really, because there was nobody that lived close. Oh, yeah. Our group was from all over the United States. In fact, the group that I went into, I was the baby. When we go into town, you can't go into that place. You can't drink this. It, I had I had about 30 fathers watching me all the time. We'd get our uh, beer, you'd get six cans a month, and you'd get six Cokes a month, or maybe it was every week or two weeks. I don't remember just what it was. But they'd take my beer right away. You're not doing any drinking. Here's our Cokes, you got all the Cokes. I, I was watched at home, uh, in the service by these older men better than I was watched at home. My father never bothered me this much. So it, it, it was, as I said, it was great. It was great. The, any Rickenbacker's outfit was, it wasn't uh, something that was started up when the war became. It began with the First World War mm -hmm. and it continued on. That's why I said I was very fortunate to be able to get into this outfit. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, uh, Watch me very close. When you, uh, after your semester in Florence, the University of Florence, did you, um, you came back here, did you continue school? Um, did you come back home? You no, I went, I went back to uh, Canisius College and uh, picked up where I left off, but I didn't, uh, no, no football after that because the Army was paying for my way through. And then I took the all the exams that were available at the time, the police, the fire department, the state troopers, and uh, I guess it was probably June of 46. I started college in January of 46. And in June, uh, on the same day, I got the uh, acceptance for the state police and the city police. Well, the state police paid $900 a year and you had to live in the barracks. The city police paid $1,200 a year, and you could live at home. So I took the city police, because, and, and I could go to work at 4 o'clock and keep going to college during the day. And I did that. Let's see, I was in college, but I graduated in 49, so I was there. I finished in three years. I went right through the summers. And uh, then I, when I graduated, I went back to night school for four years to get my master's degree. And then I started teaching school during the day and working the police department the second shift. I was on the traffic division. So this gave me a little time because I worked football, baseball, hockey, uh, all, all of the sporting events and all of the rock shows. And uh, this gave me time to get my school work done and everything else. And um, I worked at a very good school and uh, the kids were like sponges. So, I mean, there was no problems in school at all. I mean, the problem was keeping up with the kids. Mm -hmm. That was the thing. Did you join a, a veterans organization? I yes, I belonged to the Veterans of Foreign Wars and also the Legion. And uh, what kind of activities would you do with those groups? Well, uh, at first, uh, when I had time, we went on honor guards when the men died and stuff like that. And then were the parades, and uh, we have meetings every month, <coughs> which uh, the amount of men it gets smaller every month. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I don't know how long the organizations are going to be able to maintain themselves. Mm -hmm. And this goes for all types of organizations that they had. You know, the Knights of Columbus uh, and the rest of them there. And in the 40s and 50s, there was more camaraderie. 
people got together more. They, there wasn't television to take you away from anything. You sit down and talk to, with your friends and stuff like that and go out like that. It was different. It is different than it is now. Completely different world. Uh, it was a more relaxed world to begin with because everything took its own time and it wasn't uh, electronic like it is today. Uh, I got a new car and I don't know how to drive it other than put it in gear and go with all the buttons on the dashboard and the maps and stuff that are there. Mm -hmm. Probably take me a year to learn what's going on with it. How are you guys doing on time? Good. Um, five or ten minutes. Yeah, five or ten minutes. Mm. No. No. <laughs> okay. You got to wrap it up. Okay. So. Oh boy. So final words. Um, anything you'd like to add to this interview? Anything? <laughs> important to get out of a military experience or anything like that? No, I think it's a military experience is something that every person should have. That's the one thing I agree with that's going on in Jerusalem. They all have military experience when they get out of school. I think it helps develop your personality. It helps you to uh, get involved with other people that you wouldn't be involved with ordinarily and doing things that you wouldn't or ordinarily do. Uh, gives you a different perspective on life. As I said, I, I, I think it's a uh, year in the service is the best experience anybody can have. And a, uh, a one-of-a-kind experience with that, right? You're right, you're right. Um, I guess the tape stopped, but um, I was wondering, how did you meet Mrs. Brown? I was teaching school at, in Buffalo and she was a young teacher just coming in. And I met her there, and then uh, we got married a year later. And uh, she was she also taught school. She was an excellent school teacher. Can I have her, her full name? D-O-R-O-T-E-A. S-E-R-A-C-H. Okay, I, I yeah. think we got to get some pictures. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's get some uh, pictures. That went awful fast. Yeah. yeah. Time goes by fast, doesn't it? <laughs> when you're having fun. Yeah. When you're having fun. Okay, you want to stand?